Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 192, Review of Sanders's The Deep Things of God, Part 1. Here at the Trinity's Podcast, I often interview authors about their books, and sometimes I just review the books. And here's something I've never talked about before. I read a lot more books than I actually decide to present on this podcast. A lot of times I'll read a book and I'll just think, well, this is silly. It's not well argued. It doesn't make any important contribution to the literatures. And I'm just going to pass it by. It's a fashionable kind of thing, maybe, but I don't really think it's worth presenting to people. Anytime I interview an author, I think the work really is of value. It has some redeeming value. Even if I disagree with the core theology of its author, I think that there's really something wonderful about the book. And that's why I'm spending all this time presenting it. I want to help good authors get their works out there. So generally, I pass by books I don't like. Unfortunately, today's episode is an exception to that rule. It's not going to be a positive review. Nonetheless, I'm going to try to be fair. I've been aware of this book for some time. I think it came out in 2010. I didn't read it. I didn't pay that much attention to it. But I have seen repeatedly some evangelical leaders recommending this as a go-to book for evangelical Christians who want to learn more about the Trinity. And that made me curious because I wrote my own introductory level book to this subject called What is the Trinity? Then I noticed that the publisher had put out a second edition just this year in 2017. And I said, well, people must be reading this book. This book must be making some waves. I guess maybe I should check it out and see what's going on. Honestly, I didn't think I would like it, but I was hoping to like it. I went into it open-minded and curious about just what is the view of the Trinity that's going to be presented here, and is it going to make a biblical case for the Trinity? Is it going to get into the history? Is this a suitable introductory book for a Christian who wants to learn more about this subject? In the end, no, I don't recommend it, but let me start with the positive. The book is pretty well written. It is wordy. Sometimes points that could be made in a sentence turn out to be many fat paragraphs. But it's not that it's badly written. It's pretty well written. I also like that it's informed by historical literature. Dr. Sanders teaches in the Tory Honors Program at Biola University, and he reads a lot of historical material and a lot of modern historical evangelical material, and he refers to different authors and different writings throughout the book, and sometimes that's interesting. He's the only person I know of who has read that series called The Fundamentals, produced by the Fundamentalist Movement, properly speaking, in the early 20th century. So that's a good thing. You're going to find out about some writings that you've never heard of before, and maybe some of them will be worth pursuing. The book's well-produced, has an index. Second edition has notes and questions for group study. That's a good, friendly feature. Also, positively, he's not in the Jesus is God camp. Now, he calls Jesus God, like all Trinitarians do, but he doesn't sort of focus on that as if that's the end-all, be-all of Christianity or as if that's the entire point of Trinitarian theorizing. Some apologetics writers seem to think the whole point of Christianity and the whole point of the Bible is that Jesus is God himself. Well, that's not an accurate way to summarize the traditions of speculation about God being triune. Jesus isn't supposed to be God himself. God himself is supposed to be the Trinity. Jesus is supposed to be the Son of God, one of the members or persons of the Trinity. Dr. Sanders has a PhD in theology, and he's read a lot of historical theology. And so he knows that to say Jesus is God is not to accurately summarize these ancient traditions, especially the ones which go back to the councils in 451 and 381. And so he doesn't confuse the deity of Christ with the Trinity. He realizes those are two different issues. And here he's focusing on the Trinity. So that's by way of positive. 
The problems start with the cover of the book, that is, with the title of the book. The title promises too much. It's called The Deep Things of God, How the Trinity Changes Everything. One thinks, wow, deep things of God, so God's life, God's innermost secrets, or something, wow, something maybe only God would know, but something that only a very insightful, deep theologian might be able to draw out for us. Well, it turns out that the deep things of God are just the basic truths of the gospel. That's what he means by them, following some earlier Christian writers. It's just that the Father has sent the Son to be an atonement, and now that the Father has raised the Son, he sent the Holy Spirit to empower Christians so that we can have eternal life through believing in Christ. Well, that's just the gospel. Those are the deep things. It's nothing that you don't already know, Mr. or Ms. Christian, When the subtitle says, How the Trinity Changes Everything, that makes it sound like there's going to be earth-shattering practical relevance of this doctrine. You know, it's going to make your marriage better. It's going to help you lose weight. It's going to, I don't know, it's going to change your whole life or a bunch of different aspects of your life or something like this. And he doesn't really enumerate such benefits in the book. It's just kind of over-the-top hyperbole, I'm afraid. He does think that you need to keep the Trinity in the back of your mind when you're thinking as a Christian. He does think that it would improve Christianity if Christians could be more Trinitarian. A better title for the book would be something like this. To be evangelical is to be Trinitarian. Or maybe a slogan that he uses later in the book. The gospel is the Trinity and the Trinity is the gospel. Something like that would more accurately reflect what's actually in the book. This is a book I think that even someone who loved it would not recommend to anyone but an evangelical Christian. It's kind of oddly sectarian that way. Imagine that you pick up a theology book and it talks about, well, you want to be a good Catholic, don't you? And a good Catholic should this and a good Catholic should that. And you're thinking, well, I'm not a Roman Catholic. Why am I reading this book? This book constantly refers to evangelicalism, evangelical thinking, the evangelical movement, if the idea of being an evangelical Christian isn't central to your self-image, the book will be kind of strange and maybe even off-putting. It's not going to be terribly relevant to you unless you're very proud of being an evangelical. Now, I do count myself in that camp. I know we can argue about the definition of the term evangelical, And I've discussed it in podcast 126 with my friend Kermit Zarley. I was raised in evangelical churches, and I still count evangelical Americans to be my people. And on the standard definitions, I'm an evangelical. However, I would say that I'm not a Trinitarian. Dr. Sanders would say that I'm not a Trinitarian either. At least that would be his official view. But things he says in the book imply that I'm as Trinitarian as anyone ever was. What? If I say I'm not a Trinitarian, but a Unitarian in my Christian theology, how can I be a Trinitarian? Well, he's using the term Trinitarian rather loosely, as I'll explain in a little bit. Another way the book is odd is that it assumes a narrative that's popular with recent theologians. And this is something you find basically in the theology guild in this tiny world of people with theology PhDs, pretty much. I think this became popular in about the 1990s. The story is that Trinitarian theology has somehow lapsed or been forgotten or marginalized, and so Trinitarian theology now needs to be revived or recovered or renewed. And this lapse or forgetting or marginalization, it's behind numerous problems with Christianity, and so many things would be fixed if we could just recover or revive our Trinitarian theology. We could get rid of this major hindrance to the Christian movement. Myself, I wasn't taught this as a young PhD, and I've never accepted either the diagnosis or the cure. But Dr. Sanders appears to take this to heart, and he's applying it to evangelicals. He's also aware that many people in academic theology look down on evangelicals, and in general, they look down on less liturgical, you could say low church versions of Christianity. Pentecostals, Bible churches, charismatics, 
Baptists, etc. The fact is that some Christian traditions emphasize theology and historical theology and the historical creeds a lot more than those groups that we call evangelicals. On the face of it, high church traditions are more Trinitarian. Groups like the Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, even the Reformed, although those overlap with evangelicals, and Anglicans, Episcopalians, they'll stand up in their services regularly and recite the Athanasian Creed or the Nicene Creeds, and they have very full liturgies. They don't do things as spontaneously as most evangelicals do, as, quote, low church traditions do. So their liturgies are packed with statements that presuppose creedal thinking about the triune God. Bible-focused evangelicals can talk for quite a long time without mentioning the triune God as such, and they can almost entirely skip, you know, subsistent relations, multiple hypostases, eternal generation and procession, and a lot of other technical notions that are in mainstream, small-c Catholic thinking. And Sanders teaches at this very conservative evangelical institution, my alma mater, Biola University. So he's aware of evangelical theology's despisers and people who think it's not really very Trinitarian and that it's less Trinitarian than other traditions. And so he's pushing back against these, and he wants to say that evangelicals are at least as Trinitarian as any Christians are. Well, really? I mean, on the face of it, they're not very Trinitarian, just because you don't see all these elements of Trinitarian theorizing in evangelical discourse, in evangelical preaching, in evangelical popular books, in evangelical services. How can he say this then? Well, he basically argues that since evangelicals have a relationship with God, they've really been saved, they've really been born again, then they're already at some level aware of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so they have tacit knowledge, which is really just like awareness of the Trinity, even if they can't express it. So they know all about the Trinity, but they don't know that they know all about it. He calls this tacit knowledge or this awareness of the Father, Son, and Spirit primary Trinitarianism. And so he considers Trinitarian theology proper to be secondary. It comes second in order, and in truth, he thinks it's second in importance. As long as you have a relationship with God, boom, you're a Trinitarian. End of story. Now, I've talked about my own story a little bit on my blog at the start of my book, I spent more than 25 years being a very active member of various kinds of evangelical churches. I don't think I was much of a Trinitarian, but that's because I'm defining Trinitarian as a position, as something that one is committed to in the realm of belief. But I've been born again. I have a relationship with God through Christ, and I've experienced God's Spirit on many occasions. So according to Dr. Sanders, I am very, very Trinitarian. Now, I kind of think this is an abuse of words, even though I understand what he's up to. He thinks evangelical Trinitarianism has become somehow lax or shallow along the lines of the narrative I described just a minute ago. And so Trinitarian theology among evangelicals needs to be revived or somehow kind of reinvigorated. So his aim in this book is not really theoretical. His concern is not with theorizing or even really with the truth of Trinitarian claims. His aims are wholly pastoral. He wants to light a fire under the evangelical reader to make her enthusiastic about how, quote, Trinitarian, unquote, the gospel is. That is the basic message of salvation through Christ that we find in the New Testament. He goes on to argue that prayer and the practice of devotional Bible reading, things that evangelicals love so much, These are Trinitarian. So Trinitarian really just means having something to do with the Trinity. But we're going to have to ask what he means by Trinity there. This book, without its notes, comes out to 247 pages. And it's a fairly learned book. It refers to various historical sources. And a lot of Bible verses are quoted. Still... I think you could kind of boil this book down to the following letter from Dr. Sanders to the reader. 
Dear Evangelical Christian, As you're among the most spiritual of Christians, you already tacitly know everything you need to know about the Trinity. You're as Trinitarian as you need to be. Congratulations! You can rest assured that the doctrine is as biblical as can be. Trust me, if you pick up your Bible, you'll see the Trinity everywhere in it. And you don't really need to worry about any silly, distracting, logical, or mathematical difficulties which wrongly presuppose that the Trinity is no more than a set of dry, abstract propositions and not the very substance, size, shape, diameter, smell, texture, flavor, color, sheen, hypotenuse, center, circumference, substructure, glossy coating, chocolatey center, shine, and timber of the gospel. You just need to be reminded of how Trinitarian the gospel is and how very Trinitarian your evangelical heritage is. Having been so reminded, you can again let any Trinitarian thoughts recede to the background of your mind, and you can carry on as before. Just try not to confuse together the persons of the Trinity or slump down to some sort of sub-Trinitarian level of thinking. Keep in mind the differences between the three, but remember that they are the one God. If this doesn't make sense to you, not to worry. C.S. Lewis has your back. God is one person. God is three persons. No problem. You see, claims which appear incoherent to us may well seem coherent to God. There's your defense, you beautiful Trinitarian you. Celebrate your Trinitarian evangelical heritage and turn your thoughts often towards the happy land of the Trinity. Love, Fred. When the Trinity's podcast returns, what does he mean by Trinity? In this book, The Deep Things of God, Dr. Fred Sanders loves to call things Trinitarian. Evangelical knowledge, evangelical experience, evangelical strengths, evangelical practices, evangelical theology, evangelical Bible reading, evangelical prayer. All those things and many more are Trinitarian things. And very often he'll get more specific. Various things are robustly Trinitarian, thoroughly Trinitarian, profoundly Trinitarian, inherently Trinitarian, radically Trinitarian, deeply Trinitarian. So what does he mean? What is it to be Trinitarian? What is the Trinity in the view of Dr. Sanders? Well, there's a distinction that once you make this distinction, it'll radically change how you look at this book and how you view Dr. Sanders' use of terms even. This is a distinction that I spend a whole chapter in my book, What is the Trinity, explaining chapter 3, capital T Trinity versus lowercase t Trinity. Because I can't use capital letters when speaking to you, I'll call this the distinction between the Trinity and the triad. And the distinction is just this. The word Trinity is used in different ways by Christians. And one of these ways came before the other, And these two different ways of using the word Trinity are often just sort of swapped out for one another without the speaker really noticing what he's doing. So one use of Trinity is as a singular referring term. The Trinity is supposed to refer to the triune God. You see this usage all over Augustine of Hippo, for example. Very often he'll say that the Trinity is God, the one God is the Trinity, And, of course, the Trinity, in some sense, consists of Father, Son, and Spirit. Well, isn't this just how everybody uses the word Trinity? Unfortunately, no. And, in fact, if you go before Augustine, it's darn near impossible to find people using the word Trinity as a singular referring term. Universally in Christianity, before somewhere in the latter half of the 300s, when people used the word Trinity, they were using it as a plural referring expression as a way of referring to a plurality of things. And those three things were God, God's Son, and God's Spirit. However those are related, and whatever exactly those are. 
when you refer to them as a plurality, that's consistent with them really being one being. But anyway, you're referring to them as to three. It's a triple reference, not a singular reference. If you say Huey, Dewey, and Louie annoyed Donald Duck, and for some time the gang continued to annoy Donald Duck, you've just used the term the gang there as a plural referring expression to Huey, Dewey, and Louie, these three cartoon duck characters. That's consistent with thinking that they're somehow mystically one, but it's consistent with thinking, no, those are just three different things. You're just not saying either way. You're referring to them as three. That's a plural referring term. It could be a term or an expression. Okay, so the word Trinity gets introduced into Christian discourse, maybe somewhere around the year 180 AD. And then people pretty quickly are using this term in Latin and Greek, trios in Greek, trinitas in Latin. And in the early usage, say in the 200s, it's always a plural referring term. You can see this in people like Tertullian and in Origen. It's someone a little bit later in the early 300s summarizes Origen's view as the view that the Trinity are the three greatest beings. I'm going to call this the triad just to avoid confusion. So the triad is God, God's Son, and God's Spirit, however exactly those are related, and whether or not those are of the same exact ontological status. That's the triad. Then the Trinity is the triune God of Catholic Orthodoxy that, in my view, is first clearly proclaimed in the year 381. Now, when the new usage of the term Trinity came along, where now the Trinity is the one God, whereas earlier the one God had been the founding member of the triad, right? The triad is not presupposed to be God. It may or may not be the one God. But in fact, in those days, they presupposed that the one God was the Father, and then there are these two other derivative divine beings Just because the new usage came along of using the Trinity as a singular referring term and not a plural referring term doesn't mean the old usage went away. So even today, Christian theologians will jump back and forth. And you might say, well, this is a picky, silly point. Who cares? Singular referring term, plural referring term, big deal. Well, it is a big deal because in some cases, it's the difference between the true and the false. So in a couple places in this book, Dr. Sanders says, The Trinity is just all over the Bible. Like, you just can't miss the Trinity if you read the Bible. What does he mean? Now, if he means the triad, God, God's Son, and God's Spirit, whatever exactly those are, yeah, those are all over the Bible. Individually, in pairs, or in a few places, the three of them mentioned closely together. So yeah, the triad is all over the Bible. How about the Trinity? Is the Trinity just obvious all over the Bible? Well, the triune God is never mentioned as such. It never says that the triune God is the one God, or the one God is the triune God. That's a doctrine of inference. That's a theory that has to be argued for. The Trinity, the triune God, is not obviously all over the Bible, and you can be sure of that because there have long been a minority of Protestants who are not Trinitarians, And this is because of the Bible. They say that you can't actually infer a triune God from the Bible. Those are Unitarian Christians like me. But never mind us. This is a post-Reformation thing. Rewind back to ancient times, to before the year 381. Christians always believed in the triad, God, God's Son, God's Spirit. But they didn't believe those to be the same God. They didn't think the one God was the triad. They thought the one God was the founding member of the triad, generally speaking. Okay, so Trinitarian just means having to do with the Trinity. But the term Trinity is vague. It can mean the Trinity, singular referring term, the triune God, or the Trinity could refer to the triad, just Father, Son, and Spirit, whatever those are, referred to as three. So this ambiguity of the term Trinity passes over to the term Trinitarian. Trinitarian means having to do with the Trinity, but the Trinity could mean the triune God or just the triad. So Trinitarian can mean having to do with the triune God, in which case you won't see anything obviously Trinitarian in the first 300 years of Christianity. On the other hand, Trinitarian could mean just having to do with the triad. And now, well, the whole Bible's Trinitarian. 
And sure, Christian life is Trinitarian. I'm a Trinitarian. All Unitarian Christians are Trinitarian in that they believe in God, God's Son, and God's Spirit. So Dr. Sanders, in calling all of these things Trinitarian, you know, evangelical prayer, evangelical theology, these are all true so long as he means having to do with the triad, but they're not so obviously true if we mean having to do with the tripersonal God, the triune God of small c Catholic orthodoxy based on the creeds, which really is first clearly expressed, although not even quite explicitly expressed, but still I would argue, and I argue this in my book, clearly enough expressed in the 381 Creed, the Creed from the Second Ecumenical Council. I claim that is implicitly Trinitarian. That is to say, it implies that God is tripersonal. It has to do with the Trinity and not only with the triad. I don't find it really much earlier than that. I find Trinitarian theology in some of the Cappadocians, and that's about it. When you go back in time, you find Christians confessing one God, the Father Almighty. So once you make this distinction between the Trinity and the triad, it can kind of ruin the book for you, because then a lot of the things he's saying are just truisms, things that are true by definition. I mean, a Christian by definition believes in God's Spirit and God's Son and God, right? Whether they're a Trinitarian or a Unitarian, or even if they're just thoroughly confused about theology. If they're Christians at all, they're going to believe in those three things. So they're going to have a triad. Whether or not they ever call it that is another thing. All right, is the Trinity a doctrine revealed in the Bible? What do you mean by the Trinity? Look at it this way. If a doctrine is revealed, then the people understand it. If God successfully reveals something, this entails that the recipients of Revelation understand what it was that God revealed. So if the Trinity means the triune God, did early Christians understand the one God to be tripersonal? So that the Father is a person within God, the Son is a person within God, the Holy Spirit is a person within God, and they're all equally divine with one another, and somehow together the three of them are the one triune God? Evidently, nobody in the first three centuries of Christianity understood this because they don't express this anywhere. I know that some people will argue that they're assuming it. This could be a long argument. But if they don't have this understanding, then God didn't reveal it to them at that time. What Roman Catholics will say, many of them, if they're honest and good scholars, they'll say, yeah, you know, the Trinity isn't a first century idea. The tripersonal God, no, it's not really in the New Testament. The one God in the New Testament is the Father. But yeah, we do think the Trinity was revealed by God through the teaching magisterium of the one true church, the Catholic Church. The Trinity, the triune God, was revealed through the bishops in the 4th century, not really in the 1st century. Okay, but how about the triad? Is that revealed in the Bible? Well, of course. Just read the book of Acts. You've got God, the unique Son of God, the Spirit of God. There's a triad right there. A big problem with this book is that sometimes there's a kind of bait and switch. So he'll point out how the Bible has all to do with the triad. And then he'll triumphantly conclude that the Trinity, the tripersonal God, is just all throughout the Bible. But that doesn't follow. Again, it's basically a trivial point that the Bible is about the triad, God, God's Son, and God's Spirit. It doesn't follow from that, a fact which even Unitarian Christians like me acknowledge, that the Bible is all about the tripersonal God. These early Christians, evidently, they didn't get that memo, because you don't see anybody clearly presupposing a triune God in the first 300 plus years of Christianity. If you imagine that someone in the first century is talking about the triune God, historians will tell you that's an anachronism. It's projecting a later idea back in time. It's like saying that Thomas Jefferson or Abraham Lincoln had opinions about the internet. They had no idea of the internet. Well, neither did anyone in the first three centuries have an idea of a triune God in the way defined by orthodoxy after 381. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. Sanders' main thesis in this book.
Here's his thesis in the book, Words from the Horse's Mouth. The central argument of this book is that the doctrine of the Trinity inherently belongs to the gospel itself. It is not merely the case that this is a doctrine that wise minds have recognized as necessary for defense of the gospel, or that a process of logical deduction leads from believing the gospel to affirming the doctrine of the Trinity, or that people who believe the gospel should also believe whatever the God of the gospel reveals about himself. No, while all those statements are true, they do not say enough, because there is a Trinity gospel connection much more intimate than those loose links suggest. Trinity and gospel are not just bundled together so that you can't have one without the other. They are internally configured toward each other. The gospel is Trinitarian, and the Trinity is the gospel. Christian salvation comes from the Trinity, happens through the Trinity, and brings us home to the Trinity. Okay, that's basically on the third page of the book. The Trinity is the gospel. Look, the triad is just part of the content of the gospel. The triune God is something that's inferred to be involved in the good news. And nobody did infer it in the first couple hundred years of Christianity. If the Trinity is the gospel, not the triad, but the Trinity, the triune God is the gospel, then no one in the first three centuries or so had the gospel. But that can't be right. If the tripersonal God, in some sense, is the gospel, then I would ask Dr. Sanders this. Why, Dr. Sanders, is the triune God never, not one time, preached in the book of Acts? There's only the triad there. Mention of the one God, his unique human son, and his spirit, which is now poured out, even by the heavenly exalted son. There's no hint in the book of Acts that these three somehow combine together to make one God. To the contrary, the one true God is assumed in all of Acts, and indeed in all of the New Testament, to be the Father, not the Trinity. So, what gives? This is a question that many, many evangelical Christians have wondered about. As he goes along through the course of the book, Dr. Sanders repeatedly refers to modern evangelical writers often long forgotten ones because he thinks that their Trinitarianism was more vital somehow than ours. But he brings up a couple of them for a different reason, which is to illustrate a woeful mistake. Most clearly in the case of the famous hymn writer, Isaac Watts, who died in 1748. Sanders writes this, By his era, there had been considerable debate about whether this hard doctrine was in fact scriptural. The debates took their toll on Watts, and although most of his hymns and sermons are a glorious legacy of Trinitarian worship, he became less confident about the traditional form of the doctrine later in his life. Watts was as submissive to scriptural revelation as Bunyan, but he was deeply troubled about what doctrine he was being asked to submit his understanding to. He prayed, quote, Dear and blessed God, Hadst thou been pleased in any one plain scripture to have informed me which of the different opinions about the Holy Trinity among the contending parties of Christians had been true, thou knowest with how much real satisfaction and joy my unbiased heart would have opened itself to receive and embrace the divine discovery. End quote. If only God had shown, quote, plainly in any single text that the Father Son and Holy Spirit are three real distinct persons, end quote, in one divine nature, Watts says, quote, I had never suffered myself to be bewildered in so many doubts, nor embarrassed with so many strong fears of assenting to the mere inventions of men instead of divine doctrine. But I should have humbly and immediately accepted thy words, 
so far as it was possible for me to understand them as the only rule of my faith. End quote. So many evangelicals have wondered, well, is this really a biblical doctrine or not? It really seems to be confused and confusing. So is it possible that this is one of those Catholic errors that we Protestants should have reformed by now? Honestly, Dr. Sanders just blows off this kind of concern. He blows it off in the whole book. He just waves his hands. Oh, yes, of course, it's biblical. And look, this is really just misguided to get all twisted up about, is it coherent? I mean, come on, that's that crusty old problem shouldn't distract you. This is all he says in the case of Watts. This is Sanders now. Nowhere in his impassioned prayer does Watts give the impression that he is grappling with a mystery of salvation. His angst all stems from the situation of being faced with a doctrine lacking the kind of direct biblical support that would bind it on his conscience as an article of faith and its sheer intellectual difficulty. So Watts, poor sap, he doesn't realize that just the Trinity is the gospel and the gospel is a trinity, everything's Trinitarian, and if he had realized that everything was Trinitarian, he wouldn't be so concerned about this. I don't think so. If you're a Bible-oriented evangelical, you may have certain expectations when you pick up an introductory book on the Trinity. You're going to ask, is it biblical? And if so, how? Dr. Sanders doesn't really answer that. He readily shows that the triad is there all over the Bible, but as to the tripersonal God part, he never actually makes that argument in this book. You might be expected, as a Bible-oriented evangelical, to want to know how it's coherent, how it's even possibly true. No, not a real answer there. You might expect a careful exposition of the term persons. When you say that God is three persons, how is that term persons meant? Obviously, it's not human beings, but does it mean a self? Or does it mean just like a way that God is? Or like, is it the same as a personality? What are these persons? It's obviously a technical term. So in what sense are we using the term? Nope, not in this book. Nicene Creed of 325 and the revised version 381 famously says that father and son are homoousion, that they're one substance or essence. What does that mean? I have a long chapter of my book about this, what this could possibly mean, what the different interpretations are. Nope, doesn't matter, not in this book. Would you like a historical narrative about how the standard small c Catholic formulas came to be? Nope, not in this book. Referring to one of the fourth century creeds, Dr. Sanders says, having always known the Trinity, Christian thinkers now knew that they knew the Trinity. That's about all that you get. He also gives us a little just-so story told by the famous C.S. Lewis. It goes like this. That is how theology started. People already knew about God in a vague way. Then came a man who claimed to be God, and yet he was not the sort of man you could dismiss as a lunatic. He made them believe him. They met him again after they had seen him killed. And then, after they had been formed into a little society or community, they found God somehow inside them as well, directing them, making them able to do things they could not do before. And when they worked it all out, they found they had arrived at the Christian definition of the three-personal God. Wow, I mean, that's, that's just refusing to look at actual known history. It's just to smugly assume that what happened in the 4th century was always inevitable. That this was just uh, working out obvious consequences of the Bible and couldn't have happened any other way. Well, thousands and thousands of Christians in, say, the year 350 would not agree with that. They thought the Nicene Creed of 325 was a bad idea, and that it was just confusing, and that language should be scrapped. These were mainstream people, mainstream bishops, in the middle of the 4th century, thinking that the Nicene Creed of 325 was a mistake. Well, they're not in this story. We're giving a just-so story and not a historical account. So the reader is given no direct evidence about any of these matters. Well, that's not very helpful, is it? 
When the Trinity's podcast returns, my biggest complaint about the book. My biggest complaint about the book, The Deep Things of God, is that it tries to protect the reader from scholarship which the author thinks might harm her. This is an attitude that's common with pastors, and it seems to be a part of seminary training in some circles, when amongst themselves, theologians will talk about various things that they won't talk about with the congregation, because they think the congregation needs to be protected. You don't need to know about that, little Christian. Don't worry, though, I'll tell you all that you need to know. And there's another fact that comes into play here, and this has to do with what I mentioned toward the beginning of this podcast. Part of the reason why non-evangelical theologians tend to look down on evangelical theologians is that evangelical theologians have, to a large extent, ghettoized themselves. To a large extent, they operate in evangelical conferences They publish through evangelical publishers, and to a large extent, they maintain arguments mostly with evangelical interlocutors. So they've kind of cordoned themselves off. Honestly, in a lot of people's minds, evangelical Christian kind of means real Christian, people who are actually born again, and they typically take a hostile and dismissive attitude towards, quote, liberal scholarship, which in their view just simply reflects unbelief. Non-Christian assumptions are just all controlling. Now, I understand why they do this. Part of the reason that they circle the wagons and stay among themselves is that they've been excluded by non-evangelicals. And I'm even sympathetic to their critique of some types of biblical and theological scholarship. But the ghettoization, I think, is a big mistake. I think it was a mistake for the theologians to do it, and I think it's a mistake now that evangelical philosophers are also ghettoizing themselves in the evangelical philosophical society, as opposed to wider circles like the Society of Christian Philosophers or the American Philosophical Association. But be that as it may, and this ties in with the theme of protecting the sheep from too much information— What evangelical scholars will often do is they'll only refer you to in-house material. They'll only refer you to scholarship done by evangelicals published by evangelical publishing houses, and this way hope to keep you safe by exposing you to the right authors. So Dr. Sanders doesn't give a lot of guidance for further reading, but when he does, generally, is someone who is very much a partisan evangelical who's within that camp, and it's not going to be considered leading scholarship outside that camp. To me, the best practice is just to judge every piece of scholarship on its merits. I've found scholarship very helpful by Roman Catholics, by liberals, by people even before the current day. You know, each day is too beholden to its own fashions, and sometimes it's helpful to go back in time a little bit Of course, they'll have their own crippling fashions and popular assumptions. But anyway, they're different than ours. So it can sometimes help you to get a better perspective on a problem. Okay, but I see a general pattern of protection. And I don't really know Dr. Sanders' motives, but to me, the only motive could be protecting you from a lot of scholarship that's going to give you disturbing information like I've been mentioning. My Christian friend, if you pick up this book and this is your first start into thinking about the Trinity, to actually putting some effort into it, to looking into it, to investigating it, bad news. Dr. Sanders is hiding at least six whole genres of scholarly literatures about the Trinity from you, as if they don't exist. But I'm going to tell you about them now. First genre that goes unmentioned, 
textual scholars of the Bible, Old Testament and or New Testament, and history of theology scholars who view the Bible as non-Trinitarian, that is, as not having to do with the triune God. And these scholars, in common with me, view Trinitarian theologies, that is, theologies of the tripersonal God, as dating from the 4th century. Second genre would be historical accounts of the gradual construction of Trinitarian theology, that is, the sort of theology that you see in the revised Nicene Creed of 381. Now, this is a case where he gives you, as far as I can tell, one source. It's an evangelical source. It's the book called The Holy Trinity in Scripture, History, Theology, and Worship by Robert Lethem. And I could talk about this book at great length, but but basically, it's a partisan, very Trinitarian and evangelical look at early Christian views. And he looks right past the fact that they identify the one God with the Father and never with the Trinity. The obvious subordinationism of some of the early church fathers, he just sort of says, well, oh, what are you going to do? I guess they just weren't perfect Trinitarians. No, they weren't Trinitarians at all. If you think the Son and the Holy Spirit are lesser beings and not as divine as the Father, you're not a Trinitarian. To him, the early Trinitarians. I'm sorry, but it's not a reliable source. There's a whole world of more accurate scholarship on people like Justin, Irenaeus, Origen, and Tertullian. Third genre. There's a whole world of very speculative, oftentimes weird, Trinitarian theologies written in the last 100 years or so. I'm talking about works by theologians who will say very surprising things about the Trinity, very often influenced by Hegelian and other German philosophies, and they spill oceans of ink in theological literature about these, but these seemingly don't exist. Now, to be fair, in a lot of my work, I don't mention a lot of these flights of speculation either. I choose to focus on precise well-motivated and understandable Trinity theories, life is too short to tangle with every wild speculation that people come up with. In my view, these types of theories are best approached first through secondary sources. Two that I would recommend would be by evangelical analytic theologians. Thomas McCall's book called Which Trinity? Question mark, Whose Monotheism? Question mark. This discusses some of these very speculative recent theories by theologians, and another good book that tangles with some of them is by William Hasker, and his book is called Metaphysics and the Tripersonal God. Fourth category of works that are ignored here are works by Unitarian Christian whistleblowers since the Reformation. The existence of Unitarians is occasionally mentioned, and he does refer to one book that talks about disputes between Trinitarians and Unitarians in the 1690s in London, England. But he never in any way tries to explain how this could be. When you're not making the distinction between the triune God and the triad, and you say, well, these people don't believe in the Trinity, this makes them sound like just idiots, like total weirdos or conspiracy theorists. How could you be a Christian and deny the triad? What, they don't believe in God, God's Son, and God's Spirit? But they're Christians? Well, that would be a strange kind of Christian, wouldn't it? All right, so the reader's just left to suppose that these are unimportant weirdos. Surely they don't have anything of importance to say. Now, I'm not sure why he's so dismissive here, because in the past, he's taken the trouble to actually debate a biblical Unitarian. And really, he also should notice that historically, in the 1700s and in the 1800s, evangelical Trinitarians did take it upon themselves to enter into detailed debates with non-Trinitarian Protestants with what we now call Biblical Unitarians. And I'll put a link on the blog post for this episode to one source that I've reprinted. It's a debate between a very learned evangelical Bible commentator and a famous American Unitarian leader. The evangelical's name is Moses Stewart, and the Unitarian's name is William Ellery Channing. But back to Sanders. You know, he proceeds to ignore Unitarian Christians' favorite texts, John 17, 1 through 3, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. 
He does occasionally mention a few other texts which are beloved by Christian Unitarians, but he doesn't seem to register that on their face they fit the Unitarian theology, or they don't fit any Trinitarian theology. So one such case is Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Sanders loves this passage because it mentions all three, Father, Son, Spirit. But he seems not to notice that the one God here is presupposed to be the Father, not the Trinity. And he marches right past Paul's statements that the Father is Jesus' God. No member of the Trinity should have a God over him. God doesn't have a God. If Trinitarian theology is correct, Jesus should not have a God. But it's part of any Unitarian theology that the one God just is the Father and not anyone else. And so the Father is God over his human Messiah just as much as he's God over you and me. Just like Jesus says in John 20, 17, another favorite Unitarian text which our author entirely ignores. Fifth category of works that go ignored would be works that explain the official Catholic formulas about the Trinity and Incarnation, especially the councils of 381 and 451. He does sometimes give quick not terribly inaccurate summaries of these creedal traditions about the Trinity and Incarnation, but he leaves quite a lot out. And honestly, a lot of what he leaves out will disturb evangelical inquirers, such as the famous claim that Jesus is not a man, but is man. He is man. You can predicate man of Jesus, but he is not a man. That's part of mainstream tradition. You wouldn't know that reading this book. Sixth category would be attempts by analytic theologians, many of them evangelicals, to show how the Trinity formulas may be understood in a coherent way, or how it can make sense to defend the Trinity as a mystery. So analytic theologians are theologians trained in recent analytic philosophy. Dear reader, if you would care to Google the terms Stanford Trinity, you'll find a big long article by me. If you Google the terms Internet Encyclopedia Trinity, you'll find a big long article by Dr. Harriet Baber, University of San Diego. Dr. Sanders doesn't mention any of the many dozens of books and articles that are summarized there. He doesn't think you need to know about them. Major Christian philosophers, leading intellectuals like Peter Van Inwagen, Michael Ray, Richard Swinburne, Peter Geech, William Hasker, William Lane Craig, Brian Leftow. Nope, you don't need to know about them. It's not like, however, there's no philosophizing or theorizing down the book. There is some, but it's done by a professor of English literature writing in 1945. So we're back to the guy that's kind of the evangelical security blanket for philosophy, C.S. Lewis, great writer, not so great as a philosophical theologian. We'll turn to Lewis to defend an apparent contradiction, but we won't read people like James Anderson. Dear Christian, you don't need the help of all those scholars in those six different genres, hundreds, probably thousands of writings, because you're already as Trinitarian as any Christian has ever been. I admit I was a little offended on your behalf about these omissions. And part of the reason I'm offended is because I'm assuming that, like me, you're interested in the Bible and correctly understanding the Bible and not reading our own pet theories into the Bible. And when he doesn't mention these different genres, he doesn't mention biblical disputes galore. It's part of the traditional creedal Trinitarian theologies that in eternity... God generates the Son, and in eternity, God or God and the Son, or the Father and the Son, spirate the Holy Spirit, or that the Holy Spirit proceeds from Father and Son. What? Is that in the Bible? The Bible does use the term begetting, and it uses the term proceeding. Does the Bible, in fact, teach that in eternity, the Father generates the Son, and the Son and the Father spirate the Holy Spirit, so the Spirit proceeds from them? A lot of evangelical thinkers and New Testament scholars will say, no, that's just theory. The Bible just doesn't say those things. Those passages have been misunderstood by the church fathers. 
Sanders doesn't think you need to know this. He also doesn't think you need to know various non-Trinitarian readings of famous proof texts like John 1 and Philippians 2, readings by very serious and learned scholars. And again, those dissenters, Protestants who, though he doesn't tell you this, because of the Bible are not Trinitarian, but are instead Unitarian, and we often will call ourselves biblical Unitarians to make sure that you don't confuse us with Unitarian Universalists who are not Christians, we claim that New Testament teaching is contradicted by later Catholic traditions. I already mentioned in one way that there's a clash. The New Testament straight up teaches that Jesus was a man, a human person. You can't get out of the Bible that Jesus is man, but not a man. That is to say, not a human person, not a human self, but only the unity of the Logos and a complete human nature. There's a conflict between explicit New Testament teaching and later theorizing. And about the Trinity, everywhere in the New Testament, the one God just is the Father. The one true God is the Father. According to Trinity theories, all of them, the one true God is the Trinity. Which is it? It can't be both. We claim that there's a real conflict here. It's not just a difference of language, not just a nice development in how Christian theology is expressed, but it's an actual substantial difference. It's one thing to say, like Augustine, that the Trinity is the one God, and it's another thing to say, like the New Testament does explicitly, that the one God is the Father. Okay, so all these disputes not discussed, that goes on at great length with his own theorizings about the Trinity and how very important it is and so on. Do you trust him that much, dear reader? Dr. Sanders' intentions are good. He's not trying to deceive you, but he does think that he knows what's good for you. And so he's not going to tell you about those six whole genres of large scholarly literatures that might upset the apple cart of his project. He's well-intentioned, but do you trust him that much? Or are you going to be a good Berean and carefully search the scriptures to see if they teach that the one true God is the Trinity, as Dr. Sanders thinks? Or does it instead teach, as I claim, that the one God is the Father alone? If you want to hear my arguments for that, they're not really in my book, which is introductory and just sort of helping you get a feel for the whole landscape of Christian thinking about this subject. But my arguments are in podcast 189 called The Unfinished Business of the Reformation. We biblical Unitarians think that what needs to be revived or renewed is the Reformation. The 16th century Reformation didn't go far enough. Some of them got it. There are mid-16th century biblical Unitarians, but the mainstream sided with the Catholics, and they decided to double down on the creed-based theologies. Even though their official ideology is that everything is based on the Bible. They say they base everything on the Bible, but in actual practice, most Protestants heavily rely on small-c Catholic tradition. And this is very evident in Dr. Sanders' work. If you are a Biblicist Protestant, if you are an Evangelical, this should alarm you. It should all be basable on the Bible. We shouldn't have to rely on Catholic traditions of speculation. So in this episode, I've lodged some complaints about the book, And I've made a distinction that I think the book ignores, and which is very important to understanding and evaluating what he's doing, the distinction between the triune God and the triad. I haven't actually really, though, discussed what Dr. Sanders thinks the Trinity is. He does seem to think it's some one thing. It's one mainstream theology. And how could we possibly disagree with such a mainstream idea? I mean, what are you, a conspiracy theorist? Okay, but sure, what does he think it means to say that God is tripersonal? This is Isaac Watts' other question. What is exactly this doctrine to which I am supposed to give my assent? If I'm supposed to submit my understanding to this tradition, okay, fine, but what are the exact claims that I'm going to submit my understanding to? What is it exactly that I have to accept? Because there are different things that people are advertising as the Trinity, 
Some of them sound like tritheism. Some of them sound like modalism, where the modes are just eternal and God is essentially existing in all three modes. And sometimes people seem to think the Trinity is an apparent contradiction, and sometimes they deny that the Trinity is an apparent contradiction. So which is it? As I was reading this book, I was constantly paying close attention to Dr. Sanders' language and trying to see, well, what sort of Trinitarian is he? Because I've tried to sort them into some different general camps. And that I'll get into next week in part two of my review of Fred Sanders' book, The Deep Things of God, How the Trinity Changes Everything. This week's thinking music has been the track Rotisserie Graveyard by Dr. Turtle. There's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can listen to and download that entire track. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.